For those of you who have uh, been here during my uh, G3 talks, especially since we got to the big, big areas, I'm just sitting here wondering what's going to happen over the next few minutes because uh, I once was about four minutes into a sermon in this very room when all of a sudden I felt someone playing with my belt. And everybody else had seen the guy sneaking up behind me, uh, but of course I didn't. And uh, uh, it's really hard to get back into your sermon rhythm after something like that. It really, really is. But we'll just see what ha happened. Uh, I think Jeff Moore uh, managed to have the mic disaster. And uh, the, the screaming door is open right now, so we'll see if it screams as it goes back down. I don't know. Uh, we'll, we'll see how it all takes place. I have been invited to address a very specific topic, and I'll be honest with you, I'm sort of wondering exactly why that is. Uh, there may be a, some, some reason behind it that we'll discover this afternoon when uh, everybody gets together to have our little friendly discussion debate uh, at, the, at the end of, of our time today. But I was specifically given the topic of government overreach, masks, vaccines, and the Navy SEALs. Now, the only way to explain that is to give you some background. And I assume somebody, uh, and I'm, I'm suspecting Owen for this one, but I imagine that someone had an understanding, uh, an idea, of why that would be an issue for me and why I could address some aspects of this and then make some application. I am one of uh, four pastors uh, at Apologia Church currently in Mesa, Arizona. And most of you, if you've heard of Apologia, uh, have heard of Apologia because of one of my fellow pastors, Jeff Durbin, uh, who uh, really, he and, and, and Luke co-founded that particular uh, fellowship. And if you are familiar with Apologia at all, you know that it is a very active church. It is the home church of End Abortion Now. Uh, in fact, Jeff just flew back yesterday, I believe, from Germany, where he was meeting with some dear friends of mine. When I traveled overseas up through, up through 2019, I would visit that church in Frankfurt, Germany um, yearly and uh, have dear friends there. And uh, he just flew back from there, and they are attempting to get a work started in Germany in regards to abortion. I need to understand something. Uh, Germany is not an easy place to try to establish that kind of work or to try to do that kind of work. And yet uh, we've been involved with that kind of, uh, of, of a situation. There's videos online of myself, uh, Jeff, the other pastors, members of our church, testifying before city councils uh, and seeking to bring to bear a prophetic word to those councils. Now, I don't know if you would call that doing politics or not. Uh, we're not trying to say that we as Christian ministers should have some type of position, political position. Uh, but when, for example, I testified before the Phoenix City Council, the story that I told them uh, was a story that was very real to me. In 2017, we did a tour over to Germany before the uh, celebration of the 500th anniversary of the beginning of the Reformation. And we visited the city of Weimar, and Weimar is just down the hill from the Buchenwald concentration camp. And so here was this pretty little city, and right up the hill had been a murderous, horrible place. And the people of that town had just simply closed their eyes. They, they just tried to keep it out of their mind. And I pointed out that when the Americans liberated that camp, uh, General George S. Patton forced many of the people from Weimar to walk up that hill and to visit that camp to see what they had closed their eyes to. And what I said to the Phoenix City Council, and especially to our mayor, uh, uh, our, our George Soros-funded mayor, uh, Mayor Gallegos, was we will have no excuses Phoenix will have no excuses in the day of judgment 
because God knows what we know. God knows that we know what human life is in the womb. And so by continuing to favor, and in fact, since then they have even, uh, once Roe v. Wade was overturned, they have even said, we are not going to allow the Phoenix police to even investigate any quote unquote crimes in regards to this. Uh, but be that as it may, that's the kind of thing we've been involved in doing and saying to the magistrate, you have a responsibility before God. So that's a little bit of a background to what happened, and we all remember it, in March of 2020, as this news starts coming out, and as the conversation begins, and everyone who is in leadership here, you remember what was going on. There was immediately a narrative that said, we need to love our neighbor as ourselves, and to love neighbor is to do everything we can to protect their lives. Now, remember what happened right toward the beginning? Remember the pictures of the rooms filled with caskets coming out of Italy that we found out later had something that had been, those pictures had been taken years earlier, had nothing to do with COVID at all? We didn't know that then, and neither did you. We were subject to the same propaganda and we didn't know. I mean, remember the, the, the British scholar who predicted literally millions of deaths in the United States as a result of this, uh, this horrible disease? And so in those first few weeks, we were all seeking wisdom. We were all trying to think through what does all of this mean? What is the proper thing to do? None of us had faced any of this before. Uh, despite how old my fellow elder Luke Pearson thinks I am, I wasn't around the Spanish flu. <laughs> he thinks I was, but, uh, but I, I wasn't. And so we, we weren't around back then. And this was a new, unique situation. And so what do we do? And certainly, you know, you, you look around at other churches and you take some cues from, from people coming from other perspectives, but really it ends up being a decision that the elders of that particular congregation take. So why did we make the decisions we made? Well, let me tell you what decisions we made. Uh, We did not prohibit anyone from wearing masks if they wanted to, but we certainly did not demand that of anyone. And thankfully, at the time, we had a sort of Republican governor who did not try to turn us into California And so there wasn't a huge amount of pressure upon us in that particular aspect of things. And so we basically left it up to the people. If you want to wear a mask, that's perfectly fine with us. Uh, We certainly are not going to attack you for doing anything like that, but we are not going to make it something that's that's required. And of course, the leadership wasn't. And uh, I would say maybe at the height of things, 2% of our people might have worn a mask uh, at at some point or another. Um, And then, of course, at the end of 2020, they started talking about the upcoming vaccines. And that led to a whole other area of, of discussion. But at that initial time, many churches shut down. The vast majority of churches in what we call the Valley of the Sun, Phoenix, which is the fifth largest city in the United States. Most people don't know that. It is huge. Uh, The vast majority of churches shut down for at least a few weeks, if not a few months. There were just a handful of churches that did not, and we were one of them. We never missed a Sunday. Now, we almost missed a Sunday because we rent our facilities. We rent where we meet. And the church that we rent from closed down and said we couldn't use their facilities anymore. And some of you know all of the details and insurance and everything that goes into meeting almost anywhere. And so thankfully, um, Rich Pierce, the president of Alpha Omega Ministries, uh, his church didn't shut down either. But they did not have Sunday evening services. And we are used to, we meet at four o'clock in the afternoon. And so even though it meant meeting literally across the valley, uh, that's where we met for about two, three months, as I recall, uh, during that uh, strictest lockdown period. We chose not to close. Why? 
That's really the essence, I think, of answering all of the questions uh, that we're being asked today and that we will be asked again in the future. It, it may be the quote-unquote climate crisis and all the rest of that kind of foolishness that is being thrown at us right now, or it could be another pandemic in the future of some kind of a nature, I don't know. But why is it that we chose not to when pretty much everybody else did? And a lot of that's already been explained by Brother Coates in his presentation. Uh, we partake of the Lord's Supper each Lord's Day. And in fact, the way we do it, it takes a fair amount of time to do it because we actually come forward to receive the elements, the bread and the wine. And it's a, it's a central part of our worship. And the, the discussion amongst the elders basically went along these lines. We believe that the ministry of the Word of God is one of the primary means, the means of grace, whereby Christ's people are conformed to His image. And we know that there are many people that worship, that opening of the Word of God is absolutely central to their glorification of God and their experience of the Christian life each week. And so, what are we saying to them if we say, well, you know, fire up your computer or do something along those lines, uh, we're, we're not going to be meeting, we're not going to be having the supper? You can't do that spread out around computer screens. It is a function of the gathered body. And as was said earlier, it is a picture. You are proclaiming the Lord's death until He comes. That's one of the reasons I like the way that we do it, because you're coming forward, everyone can see you, you're actively involved in making proclamation that the body and blood of Jesus Christ is the sole source of my hope. And so we had a strong commitment to the importance of the gathered body for the preaching of the Word of God, for worship together, for the celebration of the Lord's Supper. And yes, at times, we are one of those strange fellowships that does something called church discipline as well. And that is all a function of being obedient to the Lordship of Christ. And as we looked at the evidence, we did not see that there was sufficient evidence to cease doing what we had been commissioned to do. And so we made the decision to stay open and to continue to minister the Word of God and to do everything that, that we did on a normal basis. It was amazing how quickly we started seeing people coming to us from California, Washington, Oregon. At first, they would come and visit because they heard we were still open. And I, I remember people with tears in their eyes as they got to partake the Lord's Supper for the first time in months, or as it dragged on longer and longer and longer in over a year. And then we had people that just simply packed up and moved to Arizona. They left those states and they came to where they could worship and to where they could uh, be involved in the ministry. But then, as you know, Toward the end of 2020, the word started coming out about the vaccines that had been promised to us for quite some time. And all of us, I'm sorry, I, there's, there's probably not more than two or three people in this room, and maybe not that many, that had any idea what an mRNA vaccine was prior to, say, November, December of 2020. I was department fellow in anatomy and physiology in college, and so I know a fair amount about genetics and about mRNA and, and, and DNA and, and all the structures that are involved in, in the genetic code. But even I had had to do a lot of reading to get up to speed on what this delivery system was all about. And as soon as I started reading, I'm like, whoa, wait a minute. What is happening here? Because over that period of time, thank you, Mr. Dora, let's all scream together. Okay, there we go. Ta-da! Anybody got some WD-40? Uh, <laughs> we all know where it is. I think we can go over and fix that thing there. It's fine, all that tough. 
squeaky door gets the WD-40, so we'll be over there soon. Anyways, uh, <laughs> I see some, I see some uh, 80-year-old lady going over there and pulls the WD-40 can out of her purse and starts going at it. All right. <laughs> so uh, during, uh, when the mask mandates started, I did a lot of reading. Like I said, I have a science background. I had already uncovered hundreds of articles that demonstrated the same thing. And there's been hundreds since then, all demonstrating that, you know, something's not right here because the actual evidence is this stuff is worthless. It does nothing. And now we've got this, this, this dangerous vaccine. And I say dangerous because it had been used in years earlier, but it was always pulled because it eventually led to the death of the people to whom it was given. And so I'm like, what is going on here? And my, my initial response was, give me five-year safety data, and then I'll think about it. Is that really an unrational thing to ask? Think about what happened in the media, how the unvaccinated were blamed for everything. I mean, the unvaccinated were blamed for the Black Death in the, in the 14th century. I mean, we were bl just blamed for everything that was going wrong. And the reality was that any rational person would go, wait a minute, there are, there are 10,000 unanswered questions here. Should I really just, just risk myself and my family? And then the pressure started coming. You'd lose your job. You can't travel. And of course, even when travel started again, I refused to do it. I have a medical condition that if I put a mask on, it causes an irregular heart rhythm, which is far more dangerous for me than COVID ever was, that's for certain. But nobody cared. The airlines didn't care. Nobody cared at all. Go ahead and die. We'll let you go. And so by the time we got toward the end of that, into, the, into early 2021, there were, there were a lot of things starting to come together. And then, out of the blue, uh, we were contacted by uh, a group of Navy SEALs. And they're Christian men, and they had been listening to our sermons and following us on, on social media and things like that. And uh, Jeff Durbin met with them and, and came back and said, here's the situation they're facing. They're trying to request... Uh, an ability to not take these particular vaccines, and, and uh, I've promised to do this, this, and this, and one of the things was that uh, this all has to be submitted next week, and that includes a, an entire presentation of their religious reasons uh, for rejecting the propriety of these vaccines. And I remember going, so Jeff, uh, that's, that's due next week. Yeah, pretty much Monday. This is Friday. Okay. So, so Jeff, um, um, who's, who's going to write that? Well, um, it's, uh, this is, you're getting an inside insight as to how things happen at Apologia, okay? Um, well, do you, do you have time to do that? <laughs> that had been the plan all along, I think, but I was just now getting the word at that particular point in time. And so in a relatively short period of time, I'd say I had about 18 hours, uh, I put together a uh, request uh, based upon our understanding of the Christian worldview for the Navy SEALs, which they submitted with their documentation. It's available online if you want to find it. They, they used what I wrote for them. And if you look at it, if you track it down, I was looking at it just a little while ago to refresh my memory. One of the things that separates it from anything that I would have thought of doing and even thought of believing only 10 years ago, you're writing something for the government. Do y'all remember was it last year or the year before last, uh, that there was a, a Christian congressman who during debate on the, the floor of the House made some statement about God's will and God's law and things like that. And Jerry Nadler of New York, one of our favorite congressmen, Jerry Nadler. No one knows who Jerry Nadler is? Thank you. I was, okay. 
when Chris laughs, you all laugh with him, okay? Uh, otherwise, he looks really silly, but, but you can hear Chris laughing, and so that's your cue uh, to go ahead and laugh. Uh, Jerry Nadler made that comment about how God's will has nothing to do with this body. And I'm like, I wonder what the founding fathers, you know, the same people who agreed to, for example, our first foreign treaty that ended the Revolutionary War. Did you ever, ever hear the words it starts off with? In the name of the holy and undivided Trinity. <laughs> that's, that's the first... The first treaty probably wouldn't happen anymore, but anyway, I wonder what they would think of Jerry Nadler's comment uh, about that particular situation. Back in, in, in my youth, we grew up with the myth of neutrality. We experienced the myth of neutrality, that there was, there was the state and there was the government and never shall the two mix and nothing that we say should bother them, nothing they do should bother us and we'll all just live happily ever after in this wonderful neutral world. But there is no neutrality. We live in God's world, and when a group or organization chooses to live in rebellion against the way God has made this world, there will be inevitable consequences. And so, 10 years before this, I never would have written something like this starting off explaining the lordship of Christ over all creation. Now, it's interesting. I was just standing here thinking. When I debate Muslims in mosques, I don't have any problem saying to the Muslims, you cannot be neutral about Jesus. You cannot dismiss him as being merely a prophet you have to recognize that the Jesus of Scripture is your creator. He's your maker. Every beat of your heart, every breath of your mouth comes from his hand. You cannot simply demote him from who he truly is. I don't have any problem saying that in mosques and to my Muslim friends because they need to know who the real Jesus is. They've been given a false Jesus. I don't have any problem doing that at all. So why shouldn't I do that in the face of, a, of the House of Representatives or the mayor of my city or any of the other magistrates? Why? But, but, but we didn't do it back then. And if I had written what I wrote 10 years earlier, I would not have started where I started, and that was with the fact that Jesus Christ has risen from the dead, He has been enthroned upon high, and the scriptures tell us, the scriptures tell the judges and the rulers of this world, kiss the son lest he be angry and you experience his wrath. That was not something I was raised with. The church is not to say to the government, if you continue in your rebellion, if you continue in your evil ways, you will experience the wrath of God. No, 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 no. We, we were over here. They were over there. Never shall the two mix. Now, I firmly believe in what's called sphere sovereignty. God's the one who created the family. God's the one who created the church. God's the one who created the state and he gave them responsibilities, and he delineates these things, and we have examples of this over and over in Scripture. And the vast majority of the valid criticisms that I'm hearing people make today is when people abandon those things. I'm the one, you can go on, you can go on YouTube right now. If you put in James White, Fritz Erba, Erba is spelled E-R-B-E, a less than five-minute video will pop up recorded in the Wartburg Castle in Germany in 2017. You'll know it's me because Josh Bice is standing right next to me. <laughs> and we are looking down into where they imprisoned Fritz Erba. Fritz Erba was an Anabaptist. He had taken Luther's translation of the New Testament. He read it. 
He became convicted and convinced by what it said that he should not baptize his children until they made a profession of faith. He was arrested. He was imprisoned. He started preaching out the door of his prison cell and converting people. And so they dragged him up to the Vartburg Castle and they dropped him into this pit. It's in the middle of one of the towers, no windows, no doors, black as pitch down there. And the hole to get into it is about that big by that big. And they tie you up and lower you down. You know how long he was down there? Seven years. Can you imagine? Seven years before he died. I don't know about you. I've said this many times. I'm not sure my convictions on baptism would survive seven years at the bottom of a pit. Infant baptism might start making sense after about, I don't know, <laughs> seven hours. <laughs> he remained firm for seven years before he died. And we took a video. And what I talked about as I stood there was what sacralism is. Sacralism where you, you are supposed to have the proper relationships, the areas of sphere sovereignty between the church and the state. And what happens is they, those, those walls break down. You heard Jeffrey talking about this morning. Starts with Constantine and Nicaea. But there's centuries of development and it wasn't all even. And it did go back and forth and back and forth. But to understand the Reformation, to understand it rightly, you must understand that it was a sacral Reformation. It didn't go all the way to where we would understand it needed to go. And Fritz Erba is a glowing example. He reads Luther's New Testament, which Luther translated less than 50 meters away from where he was imprisoned in the same Wartburg Castle. And he believed it. And by believing it, he ends up imprisoned there. And by the way, in case you are wondering, yes, Luther knew he was there and did not lift a finger to have him freed and in fact agreed with his imprisonment because Luther saw that his kind of Anabaptism would lead to anarchy. That's, how, that's what he believed. And he was very fearful after the Peasants' Revolt of 1525 of being blamed with unleashing anarchy upon Christendom. And that's why you can quote Luther before 1525 for freedom of religion and so on and so forth, but you can't after 1525 because he changed his views. Two Luthers. I gave a presentation on that on Reformation Day in 2017. You can look that up online on YouTube as well. Sacralism is something that I resist and reject. It's dangerous. But there are a lot of people today that think that, well, that's what people are trying to promote. Well, there might be some people who are. There are definitely some people expressing views out there that really sounds a lot to me like sacralism, where you don't recognize those proper areas of jurisdiction. But in my paper, in my presentation for the SEALs, I started off where I would not have started off 10 years earlier. And that is that Jesus Christ... See, I was raised independent fundamentalist Baptist, then eventually Southern Baptist. I was raised that when you heard the phrase, Jesus is King of Kings and Lord of Lords, can I get an amen? But there was a limitation automatically in my mindset. He's King of Kings and Lord of Lords, spiritually speaking not necessarily in any other realm, and not in any realm that would cause a political king to have to even give consideration as to whether they are under his kingship and will ever have to answer to him. And once you realize that Psalm 2 isn't just, well, someday down the road, or it's sort of a nice, it's a nice metaphorical song or something like that. No, this is, when, when you talk about the church having a prophetic role, 
in speaking to the civil magistrate, what are we supposed to tell them? Well, Psalm 2, I think, tells us. Speaking to the rulers and judges of the world. Verse 10, so now, O king, show insight. Take warning, O judges of the earth. Serve Yahweh with fear and rejoice with trembling. Do we say that today? Or are we afraid to say that today? Or do we even believe we should say that today? Should we say to kings and judges of the earth, serve Yahweh with fear? Well, I don't know. We, you know, we, we're, we want to be properly pluralistic. And so maybe we could say serve Yahweh and Allah and Elohim of the Mormons and uh, Jehovah of the Jehovah's Witnesses. No. Serve Yahweh with fear and rejoice with trembling. Why? Because every king and every judge and everyone that makes up any nation on the planet will someday stand before this God to be judged in righteousness. That's what got Paul in trouble in Acts 17. When he's standing there before the Greek philosophers, he says, God has appointed a day and he has appointed an individual, a man, by whom he's going, to wor- he's going to judge the world in righteousness, and he's provided evidence of this to everybody by raising him from the dead. And I've confessed many times, I had read that verse over and over and over again. It was only a few years ago that I realized it was not saying that God gave evidence of the resurrection. What that verse is saying is, God gave the resurrection as evidence of the reality of the coming righteous judgment. And we in the church today are afraid to say to the world, there is a day of judgment to come. I think it's because we've seen all those, you know, the videos of the guys walking around the sandwich board, you know, saying, repent, the end is near, you know, repent, the end is near. And, and so it's, it's just sort of a mockery. Type. We don't want to be like that guy. And yet when Paul met with the most advanced philosophical minds of his day, he didn't play their game. He said, someday you are going to be judged by the one that he rose from the dead. You're going to be judged in righteousness. And that has to be the message to every single king, to every single ruler, to every single president, to every single member of whatever NGO is now taking over the world who's trying to transition our, kill, our children and murder the unborn in the womb, you will be judged. And there is no escaping it. There's no neutrality. And so that's where I started. Serve Yahweh the fear, rejoice with trembling, kiss the son lest he become angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath may soon be kindled. You might say, well, maybe there's another way of understanding Psalm 2. Psalm Psalm 2, verse 7, you are my son, today I've begotten you. What does the New Testament tell us that's about? That's about Jesus. That's prophecy. Very plainly in those days after the resurrection when Jesus opens their hearts and minds and he instructs them out of the Scriptures how from Moses all the way through, it's all about me, this was one of those passages he walked through because the New Testament writers keep mentioning it over and over again, that along with Psalm 110. And so the, the document that I wrote for the seals starts with Acts 1731, that's the first thing. And there would have been a day in my life when I would have been embarrassed to start there in speaking to people in authority in the government, and I am not embarrassed to do that anymore because their authority is given to them by God. And they need someone to tell them openly and clearly what their duties before God are because we can't assume anymore that they've been exposed to enough Bible to know that automatically these days, sadly. Now, I have to tell you, and here's, here's, here's why I have to talk to a lot of young men today who become excited and they want to see immediate change. I am so thankful that there have been those in the past 
who looked forward and they built toward the future. They didn't think they were polishing brass on a sinking ship. They built toward the future, and when they did, they established great institutions of higher learning that were blessed by God for many generations and produced all sorts of great scholarship. But the tendency, of course, sadly, is that for places of higher education, the tendency is always what? To go to the left? To want to have the accolades of the world? And so I'm thankful those hundreds of years ago, they, they planted institutions that God used, but then as soon as they became rebellious, God removed their candlestick, if we want to use the illustration from the book of Revelation. There needs to be steadfast patience amongst the people of God. Even if you believe, yes, I believe we should be speaking to the civil magistrates, I believe that we should be calling them to repentance, okay? Do so as a redeemed sinner. Do so as an individual who knows that you likewise were on the path to destruction. Do so as a person first and foremost focused upon the Bible's statement that without holiness you will never see God. It's God's intention to make us like Christ. Our words will never have any meaning at all unless they reflect the reality of what we believe and how we live. And so as I see battles taking place, and as I see situations arising where, well, someone might ask an honest question, did the SEALs get what they wanted? And the answer is no, they didn't. Oh, well, you wasted your time, didn't you? And there you really have to stop for a second. Because I have to stop for a second and say, did I waste my time? It was only about 18 hours, but did I waste 18 hours in writing that document? And the only answer I can come up with is, you never have wasted your energy when you have sought as best you can in the face of God to speak His truth and to glorify the name of Jesus. You've never wasted your time. You've never wasted your time. I didn't waste my time personally. I didn't waste my time for the seals who read it and who agreed with it and live in light of it, even when it had the impact that it had upon them. You don't just look to now, you look to all the way down their lives and my life and the other people who read those things. And yes, even the unknown nameless, faceless bureaucrats who probably didn't even bother to read the document, they're still going to be held accountable for it. And so, my concern today is when we think about government overreach, there's a reason for it. The one thing, listen to me here, don't have much time, we are facing unique situations. Some of them might say, well, it can't be a unique situation. There's nothing new under the sun. <laughs> well, there are certainly patterns of man's sinfulness, but we have never faced the technocratic tyranny soaked in the poison of secularism that we face today. Even in the Soviet Union, they didn't have the technology we have today. The Christians can still hide in the woods and worship. Can't do that anymore. You got drones, got satellites, nothing you can do. They weren't messing with the genetic code. They couldn't track everybody everywhere. Now they can. And the poison of secularism, we as Christians must understand. Naturalistic materialism, at the heart of the secular worldview is the absolute negation of every 
positive command and belief that Jesus ever propounded to us. Secularism is not neutral. It is the enemy of the faith. And the more deeply it becomes attached to the mind and thinking of even our own people, the more dangerous it becomes. And behind all of this for me is the promise that Jesus must put every enemy under his feet. He is reigning, and he put, must put every enemy under his feet. And the last enemy is death. And when I think of the enemies of Christ, the greatest, biggest, oh, I can, I can think about all sorts of sins and everything in the church and the way the church is distracted from the gospel, and oh, there's just so many things. But when we talk about enemies outside, the greatest enemy of Christ is secularism. And we are now living in a society where the next generation coming up has been educated thoroughly within that milieu. It is destructive to the human soul. If you sit there and watch the videos that I watch and go, how did that person ever say that? How did that person come to that conclusion about, about mutilating little boys and mutilating little girls and thinking it's the best thing that's ever happened? What has happened to our society? It is the end result of secularism. It is anti-human. It's the religion of the culture of death. You must see how they're all attached together. Abortion, transgenderism, they are all a part of the culture of death. And who is Jesus? He is the Prince of Life. So there is absolutely, positively no neutrality here at all. There can't be. But what if we're entering into a period of judgment? What if we're entering into a very dark period? You could not, how could you argue, given the light that our society has had and the sin that we have committed in light of it, that God would not be just to bring judgment does that mean everything we're doing now is a waste of time? No. I'm a grandfather now. My oldest grandchild will be 14 this year. Ugh. And as soon as I became a grandchild, a grand grandparent, I realized that I need to invest my life in building for them, in laying a foundation for them. That means patience. And folks, we're all thinking this stuff through together. Me and my fellow elders, we didn't have any prophetic word from God as to what we were supposed to do when the government decided to tell us what we were supposed to do and worship and everything else. We didn't. We had the word of God and we sought to do what was right in light of firm foundations that had been laid. And we didn't demand that everybody else agree with us either. When almost everybody else closed down, we weren't sitting there going, oh boy, we're the holy ones. Didn't even think about it. They made the decision. We understood it. You go forward from there and pray that Christ will be honored. Can we have that kind of conversation today? Can we recognize that we are dealing with questions that have simply not been dealt with before? And can we get down to the foundational issues rather than all the bomb throwing and everything else that unfortunately does take place? What does that require? Patience, forward-looking, and always extending forgiveness and grace to a person who names the name of Jesus Christ. If we will simply adopt that attitude, don't demand that your, 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 your next door neighbor or your, your, your believing friend across town necessarily adopt your position immediately. Be patient. Be patient. It's the only way that we'll be able to come together and have the wisdom we need by the Spirit of God 
to do what's right in this situation. Will there be more government overreach in the future? You tell me. <laughs> there is no restraint upon a secular government. They, there is, they, they are God. So what do we need to do? Patience, trust in Christ, and speak prophetically and clearly to them. The day of judgment is coming. They will be judged. We will be judged. There is only one way to have peace with God. It's in Jesus Christ. Thank you for your attention.